Good morning, Oya Faith family. Happy New Year. Feliz Navidad. We're so happy to be in church this morning. And uh, thank you, Paul, for the music before the service. Kind of helps me keep track of time. I appreciate that. Let's bow our heads and just uh, recognize that the Lord is here. And we are just honored to be in his presence this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day you've given us. What a tremendously beautiful day because you are here. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for teaching us and guiding us according to your word. We thank you for renewing our strength each and every day. We thank you for the power of your word to change our lives and our thinking. And we pray today, Lord, that as we listen to your word, as we fellowship, that, that we will be sensitive to what you are guiding each one of us to, to learn and to carry out. We thank you for that, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. I want to share a verse with you that I was reading yesterday. I had to read it four or five times because it was just so awesome. You read the word and then you read it again and something new comes up and then you read it again and wow, I never saw that before. So this is the book of Romans, which is all highlighted in my Bible, but this really just stuck out to me. This is Romans 12, verses nine through 12. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love, in honor giving preference to one another, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. And here's the one that just really touched me. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer. And that's kind of what Pastor Bill was saying last week about the new year, just being steadfast in prayer and have that ministry of reconciliation with our coworkers, with our family, with the neighbors who don't mow their lawn. <laughs> I don't have neighbors like that, but you know, you've heard those stories. So we just thank the Lord for his word and we can be here together. Um, we wanna welcome all those watching online. I didn't, uh, welcome you this morning, but we're so happy to have that online um, group of people that join us every week. And if you know somebody who is not ready to come to church, you can let them know about our online service and the other services that are also good online. So welcome all of you. Today we want to lift up some folks in prayer. We want to continue to lift up Dennis Vandevin and Diane. Uh, and Jeannie often, Ben Jung, continue to pray for him. There have been improvements, but uh, still it's a long road, very long road. Um, Mary Kramers, uh, Hadar Shaddai, Phyllis and Melissa Morana need prayer. Uh, we learned that Mike Parkinson, Pastor Bill's brother, uh, has no cancer. So we thank the Lord for that. We want to keep praying for um, Gilma Quanteros uh, for her healing in her kidneys. Uh, Anna Perez, Ishmael Mendoza got a new pacemaker, so we're thankful for that. And uh, Nathan Justiano, uh, just his treatments, we wanna pray for him as well. Pastor Bill, would you lead us? Father, what a privilege to call you Father, that we have one that loves us and cares, as a father should care. And so we come to you with the heart, our hearts is moved for the critical needs in the body and those that are distant or near from every single one that you know that is in critical need. Father, we know people have aches and pains, they've got uh, all kinds of things that are going on. And so, Father, we commit every single person here at Way Faith and those that are friends of ours, that are extended family, we extend that precious love that the Holy Spirit can move in their bodies and touch them and bring relief and healing. And we thank you for that. We're honoring you. We honor God, for you are the true healer of our bodies. And we acknowledge you committing this service completely into your hands now. 
For we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you experience an answer to prayer or healing from the Lord, please let us know so that we can share those testimonies. Uh, we're going to have a testimony right now. Verna, you want to come up? Oh, well, I have a uh, testimony um, is on my um, on device. May I give a testimony of my faith at my workplace. In the past, I was working at the coffee store. I love to clean up, but I am small to clean the big fridge inside. My coach asked me to clean the inside the fridge. Uh, inside the fridge. The co-workers did not see me. They closed the uh, refrigerator door. I was locked in. I tried everything, I almost froze. But God told me what is in your back pocket. It was a cell phone. I called the story and they got me out. To God be the glory. In case you don't know, Vern is my daughter. And this happened several years ago and I didn't know about it for a couple of months, but um, I just wanted to let her share that because the encouragement of just listening to God after you pray. And, and she was so excited. What is that in, my, in your back pocket? So thank you, sweetie. We can call on him in all kinds of situations. We want to share some happy birthdays this morning with Sarah Mbagwa. She is 104, I believe. Yes, usually stays home, attends the, the um, um, church occasionally, but mostly just is, is home with her family. For Ethan Decker on the 2nd of January and Claudia Prabahar on January 3rd. So that's all the birthdays we have this week. Can we say happy birthday. Oh, last week. I'm a week behind. <laughs> so if you want to take a look at your bulletin, uh, we've got uh, some things coming up this week. Gwen Pierce is uh, going to have Berean Bible study today at 1230. Then Camino de Fe at 230. The Vietnamese service at 5. And Berean Spanish class at 6 today. And then upcoming for the week, Wednesday evening at 5 o'clock church prayer meeting at 6, Missionettes and Royal Rangers. And then Fridays, the busy night, uh, youth at 6 o'clock, JBQ at 6 o'clock, adult Bible study at 7. And then Saturday morning at 9 o'clock is intercessory prayer. So all of that coming up this week. And we have a missionary letter from um, Chris and Nanan, and they are missionaries to the Coast Guard up in Boston. And she says, we are so blessed to have so many nations come to live with us 
over the decade now. So they also have uh, foreign exchange students that come and stay with them. God has indeed filled, fulfilled his promise to me 40 years ago. To you, the riches of the nations will come. Your gates will always stand open. They will never be shut so that people may bring you the wealth of the nations, Isaiah 60, verses 5 and 11. We are enriched by this experience of hosting the nations and being able to share our lives, the love of God, and God's eternal word boldly and wisely. Thank you, Jesus. And then she gives a couple of examples of students that they've worked with. One young man that uh, came to stay with them from Italy uh, got his PhD in engineering, so they come to Boston, of course, to, t to attend college, and then they um, meet up with the, um, the ministry there. Another one, uh, she calls them Coasties. These are people in the Coast Guard. Two new Coasties recently joined our Bible study. Over 100 Coasties and civilians showed up the morning of the prayer service in remembrance of 9-11. So what a wonderful outreach they have there. She also wants to um, request prayer. She said, after a grueling summer, Chris, that's uh, her husband, finished four graduate courses in five weeks, all A's, praise God. He now has received the renewal of his ESL teaching license from uh, Maine Department of Education and got his job back at Avert High School. So she's asking prayer for him. Also prayer for wisdom and discernment as God leads them in their ministry there. And she herself is suffering from an unusual type of uh, colon cancer and they want to have her go into some um, specialized groups for treatment. So pray for her. So let's just pray for these missionaries, all of our missionaries. You've got a nice list on the back of your bulletin, but especially for uh, Chris and Nanan. Father, we thank you for this day that we can lift up the missionaries. We thank you that we can support them through our giving. We thank you, Lord, for Chris and Nanan and the ministry they have to the Coast Guard um, attendees and people in Boston that they just meet. We pray for her healing, for Chris, as he uh, teaches in a high school, a public high school, Lord. Bless him and use him to bring your word to these young people. Thank you that we can be part of their ministry in our giving and our prayers. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So at this time, we'll get ready for our, our tithe and offering. Some good news, we uh, last week had a leak over in the harvest house the roof was leaking but that's been fixed so we're grateful for that we're also still uh, working to save up enough money or give enough money for the Suriname trip next summer uh, that's going to be coming up and then one last announcement uh, says there's salads bread and chicken downstairs and can you elaborate on that <laughs> Okay, so this is food that was uh, extra from Trader Joe's. So Pastor Bill said lots and lots of bread and salads and Nano's chicken. Is that frozen? Uh, yes, but it is prepared and then it's frozen. So oh. All different is heated up. Okay, so prepared chicken but already are, are frozen, so you can just take it home, throw it in the microwave, there's lunch. So... He, Pastor Bill said there's a lot, and that's uh, just for anybody who would like to go downstairs and get some, uh, some chicken. So let's pray for our tithe and offering. Father, we're so grateful, so grateful for your many blessings. Thank you, Lord, that we can participate in foreign missions just by giving. And I just praise you for the work you're doing in Boston, but all over the world because of way of faith. Father, bless this church, bless everyone in it, Help us to be diligent in uh, giving our tithe and offerings so that your work can be successful around the world. We thank you, Father. We ask you to bless each one. 
Please help those who are looking for jobs to find that exact place that you have already chosen for them. We thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, church family. Good morning. Um, just listening to what you had to say about um, your testimony. David, last week, called me. Um, I think it was my grandson. Um, and he said, Mom, moms, he says, a very bad thing has happened. And he's on his way to work. I said, what happened? Someone hit me doing 110 miles per hour. So the car spun around, spun around. It was very vague at the beginning because they haven't gotten all the information that came. The police were right there, and his car spun, and he just kept going with it. <clears throat> the lady ended up not only hitting him, but hitting, running into like, the rear end of a flatbed truck that was illegally parked. They were there to help someone else, but it ended up in a fatality. And you know, there but for the grace of God. I mean, that hedge of protection that I pray for every day with our children when their parents are traveling, a hedge of protection, it's such a worthwhile prayer. And God was with him every step of the way. He was unscathed. No, he wouldn't go, didn't need an ambulance. He didn't need to be checked out. He said, I'm fine. He told the police officers, he said, I'm so worried. He said, son, you don't have a thing to be worried about. And this was prior to them determining that there in fact was a fatality and for someone just 21 just you know driving but not so used to driving to experience that and he's on the phone with me he says i have to go they're taking her well they didn't know what was a male or female they're taking the body out so the things that you witness with your eyes the things that your eyes take in are are challenging because they're always there but the fact is that he is up and walking around and went back to, he went, called work, and he said, they said, don't bother to come in, get everything straightened out. And so um, uh, I'm just thanking God for that forever hedge of protection that if we continue to and avail ourselves of his power, that he's there. Thanks. One second. Jason's going to sing with us today. So. All right, good morning, church. Uh, let's stand and sing together today, praises to the Lord. Yeah. 
Uh, we are so thankful for his leading and his, his guidance in our lives. Uh, I was thinking this morning as I was walking through church uh, about uh, the fruit of the Spirit and love and joy and peace and self-control uh, is one that you talk a lot about when you're around kids. And, uh, you know, it was, just, I was thinking about it. And if there's something missing from your life, like joy or peace, uh, if there's something like patience that's missing from your life, right, those things aren't something that we manufacture and fix ourselves, right? If you don't have peace, if you don't have joy, it doesn't come from changing your circumstances around you or changing your mindset or changing something of your own volition. It is a fruit of the Spirit of God in you, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you're looking for peace, if you're looking for joy, if you're looking for something outside of yourself or in yourself, uh, it, it really is a key that you have the Holy Spirit and seek that as the source of those things. So we are so thankful to God for what he does and how he does it in us. Uh, let's bow our heads and pray. God, we thank you so much for your Holy Spirit. We ask that today you would work in and through us and that you would be in this place in power, uh, that uh, your heart and your mind would be in us and, and that we would go from this place today full of, of you and full of all those fruits of everything, every good thing that you bring. We know that every good and perfect gift is from you, from our Father. And so we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Who is this King of glory that pursues me with his love and haunts me with the cheering of his softly spoken word? My conscience a reminder of forgiveness that I need Who is this King of glory Who offers it to me Who is this King of angels Oh blessed Prince of peace things of heaven and all its mystery my spirit's ever longing for his grace in which to stand who is this king of glory the Son of God and Son of Man. His name is Jesus. Precious Jesus. Lord Almighty, King of my heart, King of glory. His name is Jesus, precious Jesus, Lord of my King, King of my heart, King of glory. Who is this King of glory? With strength and majesty And wisdom beyond measure The great
gracious King of kings, the Lord of earth and heaven, the creator of all things, he is the King of glory, and he's everything to me.
Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough for me. Oh, your grace is enough. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough for me. Your grace is enough. Heaven reaches. Heaven reaches out to us. Your grace is enough for me. Oh God, I see that your grace is enough. Oh, I'm covered in your love. And your thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. God, may it inspire us to draw close to you. May it inspire us uh, to seek you in prayer. May it inspire us to read your word, to hide it in our hearts. God, may it inspire us to seek your Holy Spirit in every decision that we make. We thank you so much, God. Thank you for the hope that we have, the faith that we can turn to. When things go wrong, thank you, Jesus. And I am weak, but thou art strong. And Jesus, keep me from all wrong. And I'll be satisfied as long as I walk, dear Lord, close to Thee, and just a closer walk with Daily walking close to Thee, let it be, dear Lord, let it be. Oh, through this world of toils and snares, Oh, granted, Jesus is my plea. Daily walking close to Thee, let it be, dear Lord, let it be. When 
my feeble life is old. And time for me will be no more. Guide me gently, safely, oh, to thy kingdom, to thy shore. Just a closer walk with thee. Oh, grant. Fear is gone 
across the river, I'll find life's No word with pain, and then I stand his way to be. Good morning, everyone. Happy New Year to you all. We're going to be in Luke chapter 9. We're going to be in uh, two sections of Luke chapter 9, so you can turn there now. We're going to start in the 18th verse. Luke chapter 9, starting in verse 18. As we enter into this new year, um, as is common for many people, there's talk of New Year resolutions, of things that we're resolving to do this year that we failed at last year. And year after year, we say this will be the year, 
that I'll finally stick to working out. This will be the year that I'll finally stick to a Bible reading plan. This will be the year. This will be the year. For some reason, we fall short very quickly of our New Year's resolutions. Studies have shown that people that uh, have a goal of working out, the start of the new year, gyms will bring in extra equipment, extra weights for the influx of people that come in, and right about this time, January 7th, is when they start getting rid of that extra equipment, because in about a week, most people have stopped to some extent. At the start of this year, um, many of you might have the Bible app on your phone, and you can do study plans. An uh, old member of my previous church sent out this study plan for a bunch of people to read through the Bible in a year. And sadly, you even see within that people who are excited about it and get on, and it only takes a couple days before they miss a day, a few more days before they've missed a couple days, and then they're just not applying it. And so there are some questions as to why this happens, but we're going to go ahead and open up with a word of prayer, and then we'll read through Luke chapter 9 and talk more about this. Father God, we thank you for the blessing of a new year. We thank you for the blessing of a new day, for a new moment. Father, we do not take any moment for granted, but Lord, you have welcomed us into your midst. Your presence is here. Your spirit is here dwelling among us. Father, as we have taken this time to worship you, we continue to worship you in the way that we present ourselves before you now, that we might humble ourselves, ready to hear whatever truth you desire us to know. We pray that you open up our hearts, open up our eyes. Father, be glorified through the message that you give us today. We pray that it would cut deep to our hearts, Lord, that we would be continuously molded into the image of Christ. And Father, we are here now surrendering before you that you would have your way with us, have your way with this time in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, so Luke chapter 9, we're going to start in the 18th verse. We're going to read down to about the 27th verse, and then we're going to skip a little bit and go further down. So starting in verse 18 of chapter 9. Now it happened that as he was praying alone, the disciples were with him, and he asked them, Who do the crowds say that I am? They answered, John the Baptist, but others say Elijah, and others that one of the prophets of old has risen. Then he said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, the Christ of God. And he strictly charged and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And he said to all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels." But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. We're going to skip down to verse 57 now. This is continuing the cost of following Jesus. In first, verse 57, as they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But the man said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. 
Jesus said to him, Leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Amen. With this new year for Christians, often comes this idea of a new resolution of this will be the year that I will do better in following Jesus. This will be the year that I will do better in going to church. This will be the year that I will change in one way or another. It's a curious thing how quickly we give up on that. And it brings about this question of why. And most often when we give up on something, when we're not faithful in continuing something, it has to do with how much we love that thing. Today as I was uh, preparing, I was reading some scripture uh, on my phone, the Bible app, and I get this notification. uh, And at the top it says uh, something like, Sunday is for football. Sunday is for football. I don't even know uh, where the notification came from, but Sunday is for football. That's, that's the world we live in today. I love football. I love playing football. I love watching football. And I have pretty faithfully, if we want to use that word, watched a football game every Sunday for quite a long time now. There are certain things that bring us enjoyment that are simple for us to continue with day after day, week after week, whether it's football or something else. When it comes to reading scripture, for many in the church, we set out to read a chapter at night. We set out to do our devotional early in the morning with the Lord. And we struggle. And it might be different for different individuals, but I think at large it boils down to your relationship with Christ and your heart and motivation behind why you are doing these things. So if we are to set out disciplining ourselves and reading scripture and praying and fellowship and church, whatever it might be, if we are to set out in obedience to Jesus' commandment here where he says, follow me, there's a call to all people and he says, follow me daily, then we have to be in love with that with which we are engaging and we have to be in love with Christ we have to be in love with his words with his teachings with his presence with his spirit so the first question we have to answer then is who is this man Jesus I didn't I didn't talk to Paul about this message and here God gave him this song who is this king of glory for us to sing we have to ask that question And we have to have this revelation in our heart of who he is. Not just words that we've memorized, not able to give a simple answer on, yeah, Jesus is this person, he did this thing. Jesus asks his disciples, who do the crowds say I am? The crowds didn't really know. They recognized greatness. They recognized that he was someone worth noting someone worth paying attention to to some extent but they said maybe he's John the Baptist maybe he's Elijah maybe he's one of the prophets of old that has risen again they didn't really know all they knew is earlier he gave them some food and they wanted to follow him because he fed them right so Jesus looks to his disciples and he says but who do you say that I am and Simon Peter says you are the Christ of God you are the Messiah the Messiah the Christ the promised one from God. It doesn't say it in here, but if you look at this story in the book of Matthew, Jesus goes on to say that the Lord revealed this to you. He doesn't say, you figured this out. You came about knowing this. You were smart enough to pick up on things. He said, our Father in heaven revealed this to you. So who is this man, Jesus? He is the Christ. But I can tell you that, and you can go home, and you can talk to a neighbor, and they say, how was church? And you say, it was good. And the pastor 
talked about Jesus. He said he's the Christ. Right? We can repeat these things, repeat these words. We can even know that it's true to some extent, but it's a different thing to have it revealed to you. And to have it revealed to you, you have to position yourself within God's presence, within his word. And this is where it's, it's kind of interesting. In order to truly know God, you have to be in his word. And to discipline yourself to be in his word, it really helps to truly know God. Right? But they go hand in hand, and this is where spiritual discipline comes into place of, no, I'm not going to give in to my flesh, my desires. If I'm going to wake up early in the morning to spend time with God, and in the morning I'm too tired, I'm not going to say yes to my flesh. I'm going to discipline myself to study these things, because as you grow in studying the Word of God, you grow to this revelation that, no, He is the Christ. He is the promised Messiah. And then that gives birth to this great love for him, which gives birth to this great hunger for more and more. That's where we need to be. So we have to ask this question, each of us to ourselves, who is this man Jesus? Who is this king of glory? Who is he? One of the first points I have here in this passage of scripture is who is welcome in the kingdom of the Lord. We might have some new people here today, or we might have some people that have been struggling, and as we hit this new year, there are these questions of, is this kingdom for me? Am I included in those who are welcome into the kingdom? It says in verse 23, Jesus said to all, if anyone would come after me, we're going to get into the rest in a minute. There are many other scriptures that talk about the grace of God has appeared to all men, right? And salvation is for all people. There is this call to all, right? For each one of you here, Jesus has invited you to come. For your neighbors back home that aren't mowing their lawn, right? Or they're giving you trouble, Jesus has invited them to come. Right, for your co-workers that you struggle to work with, for the people that give you trouble, like them, don't like them, it doesn't matter. Jesus has invited all to come. The message of the gospel is for all. So do not think yourself unwanted by the Lord. But know that he welcomes those who truly and intentionally seek him. He welcomes those that truly and intentionally seek him. He's not looking for someone that is half-hearted. He's not looking for someone that seeks him only on a Sunday. He is looking for those that truly seek him. When he says, if anyone would come after me, in some versions say, if anyone will come after me, that word translates to this idea of if anyone has that strong inclination, that strong desire, that yearning to follow me, right? Not for those people that simply want to be fed. Jesus multiplied a bunch of food and gave it out to the people, and those people said, we'll come after you, we'll follow you. They were only after the food. They were only after Jesus being some means to an end that they desired, some fulfillment of their flesh, their own hunger. Right? When Jesus says, if anyone would come after me, if anyone would with great intention and great desire come after me. So we see in the church a lot of people that have this, this spark, this moment, of joy and eagerness and excitement. Some might come in during our worship service and say, this is so wonderful, a community. We're all happy, we're all joyful. I love this, I have friends, this is great. Right, it's an emotional experience for them. Some people might come here, some might be here today out of desperation. I have heard that Jesus is the healer and I need healing. I have heard that Jesus can provide and I need provisions. Neither of these things are bad in and of themselves. God has created emotions, and God wants us to come and delight in him. 
right? And there's nothing wrong with this emotional experience. There is nothing wrong with coming to the Lord for healing or provisions because he is the healer and he is the Lord who provides. But neither of those serve as the foundation for our faith. Our faith and our belief in God is not rooted in the fact that he simply can provide something for us. It is not rooted in the fact that we can have this emotional, joyful experience. The foundation of our faith is rooted in the reality of Christ. It is rooted in who he is and what he has accomplished. Right? These other things build on top of that and are included with it. There are many people who are simply being fueled week after week by these emotional highs that they experience. Or they're being fueled week after week because they keep coming to church and they keep getting blessed and they enjoy that. But what we see, and the more involved with ministry, uh, you'll see this is very frequently the case, you'll see someone that will come in and they just love it. They say, this is wonderful, I wanna know more, They'll take a Bible, they'll take communion, they'll take time of prayer, and then they'll leave and you won't hear from them again. They'll go back out into the world and they'll be swayed again by the world. All right? And then maybe a month or two later, they'll be back and they'll be saying something about really needing to repent and they really want to get right with Jesus and they just love the community and the fellowship they experience and they go back out into the world and they get swayed again. These emotional experiences and even the provision of food and healing and the meeting of our physical needs that the Lord provides do not give us the strength that we need when we go out into the world, right? Where that strength comes from is having your feet firmly planted on the word of God, on Jesus Christ himself, Christ crucified, his blood, the reality of those truths, the revelation of those truths within your heart. So all are called, and Jesus invites all, he welcomes all. We are glad to have anyone and everyone come through these doors and worship with us. But if anyone would come after Christ, they must truly know who he is and they must fall in love with him. And it is a process. There doesn't have to be this instantaneous change of mind where you suddenly know all there is to know about him. None of us know that, and we're still learning stuff today. But it is a growing love for who Jesus himself is. And I want to wake up in the morning and read my Bible, not so that anyone else on this Bible app can see that I'm staying consistent with the plan, not so that I can figure out if there's a special prayer I can pray to receive something else in life. I want to wake up and read my Bible because I want to spend time with the Lord, because I am in love with the Lord, right? There's a teaching in Matthew, this story Jesus tells about the ten virgins that are waiting for the Lord's return. And half of them, it says, have oil in their lamp. And the other half don't. There are a lot of people that are relying on the oil of those around them. There's, there's too much in there to get into the teaching on that. Um, but I can't stress this point enough that too many of us are dependent upon the faith of those around us and dependent on the knowledge of those around us and dependent on the relationship others around us have with the Lord. And when we get to heaven and you stand before God and God says, who are you? And you say, I'm a friend of Jason's or I'm a friend of Pastor Bill's. That's not going to get you anywhere. That's not going to do anything for you. We cannot rely on me to come forward and tell you what the Bible says. And then you go forth this week and say, well, I got my fill. I know what the Bible says because Jason told me. Right? I am here to teach. I am here to present the scripture. I'm here to expand on what the scripture says. 
so that you might be encouraged all the more to go pursue that relationship with Christ, so that you might be encouraged all the more to go dwell in his presence, to seek out these things, to put to test the things that you have heard. So all can follow him. He's invited all to come, but you must come intentionally with the desire to know him. And if you do, the question then is, what is the cost of following him? It's important to note that there is not a cost or a price to pay to be included in the all who may come. Christ paid that price with his blood on the cross. There is not a cost for you to suddenly deserve the grace of God. There is not a price you pay to earn your right within the kingdom of heaven. But truly following Jesus does cost something. Having had the price paid by the Lord Jesus Christ, having had the way paved by him, and the doors open, and the invitation to freely come, should you now come, Jesus starts by saying you must deny yourself. You must deny yourself. And the word here for deny talks about complete denial. It says utterly deny yourself, truly and fully deny yourself. So what does that mean? Because we can take that word, and I could end the sermon here, and we could go out and we could have a hundred different reasons of the level of denial we're supposed to have and what that looks like. This is not a teaching of, the word is asceticism, and it's this idea of you must rid yourself of all joy completely in the world. You can never watch another game of football. You cannot have technology in your house, right? Some people say you have to practice celibacy, right? You can't have relationships. You can't drink coffee. You can't have sugar, right? There are some people that take it to this extreme and say, if I am to deny myself and follow Jesus, I cannot find joy in anything else. They say, that's what this is teaching. And they go and they practice that. That very quickly becomes a man-made religion. There are many who do the complete opposite of that. And they say, Jesus didn't really mean you have to deny yourself. We can still enjoy things. But they use that as an excuse to practice what's known as hedonism, which is living for the self-enjoyment, right? Living for all those things in life that gratify yourself. It is the complete opposite, right, of self-denial. It's allowing yourself everything. So we land somewhere in the middle of that. I think what sums up very well what Jesus is teaching here, and we have to look throughout Scripture, right, because Scripture doesn't contradict itself. And for those of you that truly study the Scripture, when you come across a verse that you need to expand on, Right, or a verse that is difficult to understand. We use all of Scripture and the truth of Scripture to interpret those meanings. Right? And so if there's a verse where you say, you know, Jesus is saying this, it just doesn't make sense, but over here in Hebrews, it's very clear what he's stating. We can gather meaning from other passages of Scripture. And there's many Scriptures that talk about denying yourself, that talk about not serving or gratifying the flesh. Right? So it's not just taken from this. It's not me saying, I'm going to interpret what this word deny means. Right? But we look other places, such as Philippians chapter 3, verse 8. Paul says that we are to count all else as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Jesus Christ our Lord. We are to count it as loss because of the surpassing value of Jesus Christ our Lord. God has created this world. He has created nature. He has created food. He has created all of us. And he desires for us to find joy in his creation. Right? This isn't saying you can't go on a hike and say, wow, I love fresh air and I love these trees. Right? We are to find beauty in those things and find joy in those things. But the surpassing value of knowing Christ, 
There's no comparison. There's no comparison. There should be nothing competing for your love. There should be nothing competing for your joy. Which means today, after the service, if I go home and I'm going to watch some football and I feel convicted, right, that voice that says you should really spend some time with the Lord, without hesitation, I should go to him. Right? And, and it's different for different people at different times. Right? The Lord convicts us in moments for different reasons. He calls us to him to greater degrees at different times for his purposes. Right? So I can't have this conviction of don't watch football today, spend time with the Lord, and then I see someone else watching football and I say, hey, you're sinning. Right? God speaks to us. He speaks to us broadly but he also speaks to you individually and weighs your heart, right? So we can find joy in other things. You can watch football. You're probably better off not watching football, especially if you're a Redskins fan. But you can watch football, right? You can, you can do these things, but they so greatly pale in comparison to the surpassing value of knowing Christ. Jesus doesn't want there to be any competition. If you are truly going to come after him, he says your heart cannot be pulled in two different directions. You cannot love both Jesus and something else with any degree of closeness. We must forsake those things. He goes on to say, you must carry your cross. He says a key word here that we all need to know, and that word is daily. Because many people can leave here and we have to deny ourselves and we have to carry our cross. And they'll go and they'll slip up. They'll be caught up in something. They won't listen to that conviction of spending time with the Lord one day and they'll think I messed up. This is something that we daily apply because we are still living in our flesh. Your flesh still desires these things, right? And we, and we can say that finding joy in going on a hike, and finding joy in food, and finding joy in football, and, and fellowship with other people, and whatever that might look like, we could say that those aren't bad things. But when the flesh is leading you into these things, and when the flesh is saying, I want this, feed me, that's where the danger lies. We battle the flesh day after day. Jesus said, you must pick up your cross daily and follow me. If we look in Galatians 2.20, it says that, this is Paul, he says, I have been crucified with Christ. I have been crucified with Christ. Right? And we crucify our flesh and we crucify our sin day after day as we get up in the morning, Lord, I am crucified with you. It is no longer I who live, but you living in me and through me. As Paul shared during worship time, if you don't have peace, right, peace is a fruit of the Spirit. It's not something you muster up with your own strength. I'm going to figure out how to have more peace or more joy. You're going to pursue him who is peace and who is joy. This idea of carrying your cross is taken both physically and figuratively. Physically, Jesus says, in this world you will have trouble. The world will hate you because they hate me. You will be persecuted. And you will have to be prepared should you choose to come after Christ and follow him. You must know that it won't be easy with regards to the things that you will face in this world. The world will not love you because you follow Jesus. That's becoming very clear. It has been very clear. And it's just exponentially growing year after year. The world's hatred for those who are serving Christ. I mean, just this notification that I get that says Sunday is for football. Fifty years ago, 
hundred years ago, there was a much greater understanding among all people of this idea of the Lord's Day, of this idea of setting apart time for the Lord, even for people that weren't believers. There was an understanding, but you look at how greatly things have changed, where now everything is given over to the world, everything is used for the world, used to gratify the flesh. So there will be persecution, and we must pick up our cross. There will also be this idea, figuratively, of denying yourself, this self-denial that we must do every day. Right? It's, it's not something you have to wake up every morning and, and recite something about denying yourself, but at the same time, it would be beneficial for all of us in the morning to get up and say, Lord, I'm not living today for my flesh. I'm not living today for my desires. I'm living today for whatever you desire. The psalmist writes that as you delight yourself in the Lord, he will give you the desires of your heart. So you come to him in the morning and you say, my flesh wants these things, but Lord, I am delighting myself in you. And you will notice that God will change those desires. You notice it a lot if you practice fasting. Anytime I fast, I get hungry. And then I go and I read the word and God removes the hunger because I'm filled, I'm satisfied in him. And then a little while later, I might be out doing some other things besides spending time with the Lord, but I'm still trying to be fasting, and, and I'll start getting hungry because I'm not with the Lord. I'm out in the world, and I'm allowing the flesh to speak to me, and I'm saying, you really should go ahead and go eat now. And I go, and I read the Word, and I'm satisfied. Right? If we delight ourselves in God, He will satisfy us. So the question then, we need to ask ourselves is, will you forsake all for the surpassing value of knowing Christ? Will you forsake all things? Are you willing to give up all things? Because as I say that you can still enjoy the things of life, oftentimes God does call us to give up things. One pastor that I listened to a lot, he had a real passion for basketball. And he had a real gift for playing basketball. He was incredibly talented. He was doing well. He had scholarships. He had opportunities to go very far. And he felt very strongly as he came to Christ that he was to get up, give up his goal, his pursuit of becoming a professional basketball player. And he was to go into ministry and serve the Lord. For some people, they follow after God and you can continue you know, if your goal is to be a professional basketball player, there are many professional athletes that love the Lord and serve the Lord, right? But sometimes the Lord does call you to completely give up those things. And are you willing to? Will you forsake all things for knowing him? He says, what does it profit you to gain the world but lose your soul? What does it profit if you gain the whole world but lose your soul? Momentary gratification, momentary satisfaction, and then eternal condemnation. As we enter into this new year, we need to very carefully look at our lives and our relationship with God and say, okay, I come here because I believe in God, and I lift my hands and I worship because I believe in God, but does the life I'm living reflect that? For Scripture teaches that when God gives you his spirit, you are a new creation. The old has passed away. Instead of a New Year's resolution, it's a new life resolution. I try and stay away from those catchy terms that people sometimes use, but I think that one is true. It's a new life resolution. Jesus says, those that are ashamed of the Lord, he will be ashamed of them. He will not know them. So do you find yourself with opportunities to present the gospel of Christ to those around 
and do you back down? Do people ask you about Jesus and do you shy away? Are you very closed off with your faith? What does the life of someone who has answered the call to follow Christ truly look like? Because the life of someone that loves football, that is passionate about their football team, their favorite football team, they're wearing jerseys, they're wearing hats, they're attending games, they're talking about the team. It is very evident and clear when someone is truly passionate about something. If there is a a movie that has just come out and people are in love with the movie, they can't help but talk about it all the time. If something exciting has happened in your life, you talk about it all the time. For many people, the work that you do day after day, you wear it on your sleeve, you make it evident to those around you because you're passionate about it. There are things in life that we love. There are things in life that we are passionate about. There are things in life that we pursue and that we make known to people. And it is evident to people, right, our love for those things. And so if you sit here and you say that I am passionate about the Lord and I have answered the call to follow him, is it evident to those around you? Have you forsaken all things for the surpassing value of knowing Christ as your Lord? Do you rejoice in him constantly? Do you rejoice in him openly? Sometimes something good happens in someone's life and we want to say praise God, but we hesitate to even say something like praise God. We hesitate to give thanks to God in front of other people because I, what are they going to think if they know I'm a Christian? We can't stand here and say that we truly have answered the call to follow Christ and yet go out in the world and not follow Christ, not be image bearers of Christ. We cannot stand here and say our greatest joy is placed in Jesus and then go out in the world and spend a majority of the time with things that are not Jesus. We need to truly reflect upon our own lives and say, Lord, am I more in love with you than anything else in this world? Do I have more joy in you than anything else in this world? How much longer will we say, I will follow Christ, but first let me do this and that? One person came before the Lord and they said, I will follow you, but first let me go say farewell to my family. That seems like a good thing. It seems like there's nothing wrong with saying goodbye to your family, nothing wrong with burying your father. Right? But it's this idea of, but first, but first let me do this. I love you, Lord, but first let me do this. Jesus says, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. God does not desire half-hearted people that follow him on a Sunday, that follow him for his provisions, that follow him when it's convenient. He wants to have a personal intimate, loving, joyful relationship with you. With each and every one of you. In the book of Revelation, in the third chapter, right, in the, in the, in the early part of Revelation, there are these letters to churches, and in the third chapter, at the end of it, there's a letter to the church of Laodicea. Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone would open that door, I will come in. I will eat with him. I will have fellowship with him. Many of you have opened that door. 
Maybe all of you have opened that door, I don't know. Maybe you haven't opened that door. Maybe you know someone who hasn't opened that door. Jesus is standing at the door of your life. He is relentlessly knocking upon the door of your life, asking to come in to bring you the greatest love and joy you could ever experience. Constantly, time and time again, knocking and knocking and knocking and knocking to come and dwell with you. One day he will stop knocking. One day he will stop knocking. Whether that's with us passing away or his return, do not say, let me first go and do this. May today in this very moment be when we answer the call to forsake all things for the surpassing value of knowing Christ. May we come after him. We have communion, but I'd like to pray right now. And then we'll partake of communion together. Would you pray with me? Lord, we are so undeserving of your infinite love extended towards us. And we are so undeserving of your grace and your mercy and your forgiveness. Father, even as we turn from it to pursue other things, you still chase after us. You still stand at that door and knock. Father, we are so unworthy of your patience and your love for us, but we so greatly need it, Lord. Father, I pray that you would instill within our hearts such an eagerness, such a joy, such a love for who you are, that we would be overwhelmed with a desire to pursue you, that we would not hesitate to give up anything and everything that you ask us to. Father, that you would be first, that it would be only you, Father, within our lives. Lord, we look unto this new year you have given us, but more than that, Lord, we look towards the next moment you give us, the rest of this day, Father. May this day be given unto you. May every thought and action be taken captive in obedience to you and your word. May we joyfully live out this afternoon, this evening that we have before us for the purpose of glorifying you. And may that continue day after day after day after day until you return that you would be glorified within us, Lord, and through us. Father, we are so humbled by your love towards us. We give you praise. Father, we joyfully praise you with great thanksgiving. For you alone can save, you alone have saved, and you alone our hope is found. And so we just praise you now and ask that you continue with us in the name of Jesus. Amen. If some elders or deacons could come forward, we will take communion now. Same night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he took the cup. 
He did this with his disciples. He knew he was about to be betrayed. He had those that were following him who had not forsaken all things, who had not fully denied themselves, and who would ultimately turn from him. But he took the bread and he took the cup knowing that. He said, do this in remembrance of me. We are to reflect upon what Christ has done. This is not something simple that we do as a church together. This is something that God has called us to do, to do intentionally, to do with purpose, with understanding. We do not take communion because those around us take communion. We do this to remember Christ. We do this to praise Christ for his body and for his blood. For the healing and salvation that is found in him. Father God, as we partake in this, I pray you would condition every heart to look solely unto you. That you would be magnified. That you would be exalted and set apart as Lord within our lives. We are so grateful for all that you have done. Father, as you have called us to come, may we answer that call. May we joyfully answer that call. Amen. 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 You may come now and take communion back to your seat. there are any who have not been served and need us to come to you, please just raise your hand. Pastor Renato, would you pray for the bread? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for this opportunity to remember this great love that you show up to us. Thank you for all the benefits, your mercy.
mercies, your blessings, far o but over all for your love. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's share the bread together now. Pray for the cup. Our precious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the fact that you were able to sacrifice yourself. You were able to see the value that we can provide so much so that you laid your life down. You let your blood be spilled out for the remission of our sins. Mm. As we drink of the cup, as we take of the uh, communion we just ask that you touch each and every one of us mm -hmm. touch our hearts yes. open our hearts up to your spirit that we can receive your forgiveness mm -hmm. for the sins for which we have committed mm -hmm. in the precious name of Jesus we pray amen, amen. let us drink together Praising you, Lord, for the cross, for your blood, for your body. Praising you for your grace and mercy, Lord. We glorify you. Hallelujah. Barbara, would you close us out? Father, we thank you for this year, for your loving kindness, for all that you provide for us. You said that you inhabit the praises of your people. So we thank you. We continue to give you thanks and praise every day, all the time, because you inhabit our praises. Lord, we just ask that you would be with us as we go, as we come. You promise never to leave us or forsake us. Let us be ever mindful of your presence with us and hear and listen and be sensitive to those things that you want to say. Speak to this person. Be, do something kind for that person. Just listening always to your voice and being obedient. We ask you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And God bless you all. We will come and collect the communion cups. And remember, there's food downstairs for you all as well. Be encouraged. Be blessed. Bless each other. Amen. <laughs>